Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB. Wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you stream your video content so you can see our beautiful faces. We appreciate you consuming uh, the show as always and we have a lot to get to with you today. Of course, I am Nate Bucati, joined as always by Carter Augustine and Ali Trost. Carter, you're at uh, the, the Compass Minerals uh, training complex for sport in Kansas City. How are you doing today? Doing well, Nate. You know, about halfway through a, a busy month. How are you? Yeah, and uh, halfway through and, and three wins in nine days as a part of that busy month as well. We're going to talk about, I'm doing well, Allie Trost in her hipster uh, crossroads apartment as always with the nice skyline in the background. How are you? Doing well, Nate. Doing well. Just uh, enjoying uh, an exciting sporting win and looking forward to tomorrow. It's all happening so fast. <laughs> yeah, a couple of exciting sporting wins actually since the last time we convened. So we're yeah. going to talk about that. We'll recap the 1-0 victory over Chicago Fire. We'll recap the 2-1 win over Nashville that uh, came over the weekend. We will preview the upcoming match at FC Dallas, as Ali mentioned, on Wednesday night. And we'll talk about some news around the league and within Sporting Kansas City. Another schedule change. That's that's Evergreen. Hashtag Evergreen tweet there. Uh, schedule change in professional sports in 2020. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that as well. And we are excited to say that we will be joined by the author of one of the greatest goals in Children's Mercy Park history, Eric Hurtado. Uh, also uh, soon to be daddy. Eric Hurtado as well. So we'll talk with him about all those things coming up. And so guys, I guess we'll start there before we even get into uh, looking all the way back to the Chicago fire game. Speaking of fire, that goal by Eric Hurtado uh, to, uh, to that was hashtag fire um, from, uh, from Eric Hurtado. And I'll, Carter, I'll start with you. Have you thought of one better? that you've seen with your own two eyes, at least in, in a sporting Kansas city match, or maybe in, in one you've just seen as a fan anywhere. Man, uh, in person. No, I got, I think that's probably the best one I've ever seen. Um, the one that stands out, I think is quasi. And mm -hmm. those are the two that kind of, uh, for sporting wise, any, uh, that I think that'd be the only one given a run for its money over the last 10 years. I mean, just sensational. The ball hung up for so long and, and you just couldn't, you thought, is he going to shoot this? And uh turns out, yeah, he, he was. And, I mean, just, just incredible. Well, I loved what, I loved what Johnny Russell said after the game, he made it a point to just explain how difficult that shot really is and how much confidence it takes and the technique and every single thing that happened leading up to that goal and then the execution of it requires so much confidence. And it's not really that surprising because Eric Hurtado came in with so much confidence in that game, was buzzing all over the field, was playing fantastic. So that goal was uh, just kind of the icing on top of the cake. But when it comes to like grading goals, I mean, I feel like you have to look at it on a spectrum, right? Because there's like a level of difficulty you have to, to factor in and and then just the, the beauty of the shot and how clean it was. But uh, Carter, you bring up a good point. Quasi's goal in the U.S. Open Cup a couple of years back was great. Benny Bikes, uh, Benny Failhaber, and some of his bicycle goals. Jimmy Madronda's had some nice strikes over the years. So those are a couple of players who had some memorable strikes that come to mind, but nothing uh, like that volley. And the fact that he said he scored a handful of them. So maybe we'll be seeing more of those this season from Eric Cotato. Yeah, Peter Vermees told us that during the news conference um, on Tuesday. Uh, some of the players that Carter, I know you interviewed afterwards, said, look, we see this from him in training. You're training a lot. Um, I don't know how many goals like that you've seen, Carter. But I think Ali makes a good point, too, that when we talk about this best goal, uh, I guess there are a lot of different criteria that you could throw into it. Context, uh, what does the goal itself mean? What are the stakes, um, the degree of difficulty? Um, you could talk about the team aspect of it. You know, how many things led up to it that, that made it a beautiful goal? But from a degree of difficulty standpoint, and, and and I don't think we're talking too much luck. Obviously, anytime you take a volley like that, there's going to be an element of luck because just it, you can strike it several times in a row and not not hit it even perfectly, even if you're as, as skilled as Eric Hurtado. 
but that was skill. That wasn't luck. That, that, that's a guy that that's, uh, as Peter Ramiz said, done it enough times to even have the idea that I'm going to try this here. And I'm with you. The, the car, the, the, the quasi goal was the first one I thought of. And I had to go back and watch it. Um, because I guess in my mind's eye, I was still thinking maybe that was a, a, an even tougher one, but I don't think it was. I look back on it. I mean, Quasi was, was look, really tough goal. And most of us would, would not even come close to hitting it. So we're, 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 I'd we're be dissecting, whipping all over the place. Yeah, we're dissecting elements of greatness here, but he was, he was, he was lined up toward the goal. He had a chance to kind of, you know, to, to, to measure everything up and, and strike it straight on towards goal. Eric Hurtado was running in the almost opposite direction of the goal and from a tough angle and on a pass. And I guess my description, I wasn't happy when I went back and watched it. I said from 35 yards away, I think it made it sound like I was referring to the shot being 35 yards away. My point was the pass was coming from 35 yards away. And you guys have tried volleys before the closer the ball is coming, you know, the, the, the origin point of the volley to me, you know, is, is relative to the degree of difficulty. You pass me the ball from 70 yards away and I try to volley it. That's going to be harder than if you're seven feet away from me and loft it up to me and I try to volley it in. And that's, I guess, one of the things that stood out to me. And Carter, you talk with Amadou Dia about it. Sounds like that was in the works. I mean, this wasn't just some accidental happening that, uh, that we saw in this game. Well, he and, and Hurtado bro both brought up separately that they actually had been talking about that exact movement in the game. I don't think either of them in their wildest dreams would have uh, painted that picture. Uh, I mean, that's a just it's a, sen a sensational goal that, like I said, I, they couldn't have even dreamt of that, I don't think. So um, it, it was really fascinating to me that him coming into the game as a sub, they would have already talked about, hey, in the game, if I get the ball in this situation, you know, make that that run into the space behind. and. Um, it, it, re rewatching the game was actually really interesting to me just like a minute or two before Dia had it on the left and, he, and it looked like her title kind of made the same movement, but it wasn't enough time for Dia to p make the pass. And so he kind of did something else and they recircled it. So it was really fascinating to watch. He, he, they did the same type of play just like two minutes before that um, had to re recycle things. And then it comes back in and I mean, the ball over the top, and yeah, not only the distance, but how high the ball was lofted as well. So he's got to strike that one over his shoulder. He hits it right on the end step. And I mean, it's a sensational goal. And 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 for Vermees to immediately draw back to Van Basten in 88, you know, one of the more famous goals of all time, um, that says a lot because they have a lot of similarities. Catching it on the end step there into the into the side netting on the far side. It's uh I don't know, I don't know about you guys, but I mean it was the the reactions from everyone around me, I was right next to the the subs warming up, and I wish I would have quickly taken out my phone and got a picture of Graham Smith because he just, I mean, <laughs> it, I mean, just mouth agape, um, just shell shocked, and uh, I think he wasn't the only one. Yeah, I think just about everyone watching that entire play go down just had you know mouth jaw just fell to the earth's core. I mean, it was just an absolute, Carter, like you said, sensational goal. And yeah, Amadou Dia, we can't ignore him in all this because what an accurate pass. And you could kind of see Hurtado, they make that contact. He adjusts his run just a little bit to give himself the, the proper amount of timing. So you could just sense the the instinctual nature of the, the connection between both him and Dia and that, yes, they had to run that play multiple times at training because, I mean, the way it was executed was just absolutely flawless. Uh, definitely looking to see more of that. Amadou Dia has been uh, electric on that left wing and creating chances, and, and he's had a lot of great crosses into the box, whether or not anyone gets on the end of it, but looks like he and Hurtado have that, have that chemistry and have that connection, so looking forward to see uh, what they can do down the stretch here. And guys, it comes as a part of a 2-1 victory that I think is a big, big win for Sporting KC. Any win is big in this type of season where you get three points, but we had talked, Carter, before the game that the whole storyline was going to be can Sporting KC break down this Nashville team? And we didn't really spend much time talking about can Kansas City come from behind <laughs> against this type of defensive team? in Nashville and they were forced to do that because of the goal that came early in the game. And they were forced to do it again without 
not all in Polito, who's with the Mexican national team. Um, wh- what was your take on the way they handled that challenge of not only scoring a couple of goals against a really stingy Nashville team, but doing it in a situation where they had to do it for coming from behind? Yeah, I was a little surprised. I think it was a slow start for sporting and actually Nashville looked pretty decent in the, in the opening stages. And to your point, yeah, they, I mean, coming in the game, they what had only scored a handful of goals on the season. So you, you, you didn't really see them as a threat. You look at, offensively. I mean, I, I, I think they're still trying to figure out what players they want to play up top. I mean, they bring in Cadiz, right. And, and he's still working his way into the squad. So Maybe he's a guy that will have some solutions for him, but not the most dangerous of, of attacking power on display for Nashville. So credit to them. They came out, played really well. I thought controlled the game for the, the early stages. Walker Zimmerman, I mean, the guy's a monster on set pieces. It's it's incredible. Year after year, it, what, at every team he's been at, he just seems to, to create havoc in the box. It's a phenomenal leap, great goal. And then um, I, I don't know about you guys, but what stood out to me was – uh, I thought it was a, a real captain's performance from Johnny Russell. And first of all, to to make the slaloming run that we see so many times in the box to create the goal for Gerso. But then when the sending off happens right after that, how many times did we see Russell pick it up on the right-hand side and pretty much dribble all the way across the field, dribble past a couple of guys horizontally to create some, like when you're, when you're down, when the other team's down to 10 men, you really – have to put the onus on and, and grab, grab the game by the, by the scruff of the neck. And, and Ali, I thought Johnny Russell did that for, for right after uh, Nashville got sent down the 10 men. Yeah, we talked about this on the final whistle show. If you had to give a man of the match to any of the sporting uh, guys in that game, of course, Eric Hurtado comes to mind because of, of the goal and scoring the game winner. But Johnny Russell had, like you said, a captain's performance. And I loved what he said after the game about – uh, his run that set up the Gerso goal. He noticed, you know, Dana Lovitz was on. He he, if he had fouled Johnny, he's out of the game. So even before, eventually, the the foul was on John Luca Busio, and it, and it was Alistair, and and it all ended up working out that way. But Johnny Russell was targeting him and knew that, hey, I can make this run because if he's going to foul me, well, then he's out, and we're setting ourselves up for you know for a, a dangerous set piece. So he kind of was playing with that uh, with that in mind, knowing that, hey, I. I can take it all the way to the touchline and make him foul me. And in that case, you know, he was able to just draw the defender and create that space for him to have a, a clean shot at uh, taking it all the way down and, and getting a beautiful cross. I mean, just put it on a platter for Gerso. I, I, anyone could have put that one in. He just, that was a beautiful cross from Johnny. Carter, you called it a, a captain's performance. And I think that's significant. And, and I'm going to tell a quick, if I can, Nate story. We'll see if I can pull this off. <laughs> Quick. quick by my terms in 1989 i was in eighth grade and i had a teacher named mrs mayfield who did not like me and she had good reason not to like me i might shock you guys but i was a bit of a class clown i talked too much in class uh made it difficult on the teacher and i uh i knew the teacher didn't like me i knew that was my 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 story my stereotype in the class or whatever that was the role that i was to fill and i filled that role every day she left on maternity leave, uh, and we had a long-term substitute, Mrs. Gregory, came in. And looking back on it, I swear she did this on purpose. One of the first things she did when she took over the class was she named me classroom monitor. And she pulled me aside before recess one day and said, you know, you're one of the real leaders of this classroom, and the other students really look up to you, and I think that's a great quality, so I really need your help to make sure that the rest of the classroom pays attention and, and stays on board. And, and I'm counting on you to really help me out. And nobody had ever said that to me before in a class. And I took that responsibility to heart. All of a sudden, I went from being the, te- the guy that the teacher couldn't stand and the goof off to the guy that, you know what, the other kids like you and you can help the teacher out. And I thought, man, I can really do this. And, and I bought into it. And all of a sudden I changed my behavior in class. And I'm not saying Johnny Russell has been like, the, the coach hasn't liked him or anything. But my perspective of Johnny Russell this entire time has been a guy that all the guys like, everybody looks up to, one of the funniest guys on the team. And I don't think anybody would have put him in the top, I don't know how, how much, five or whatever, when you'd say that guy's going to wear the captain's band. I know he told you after a game one time, Carter, that means a lot to him to have that responsibility. And I just wonder 
it looks to me like a guy who's playing to make sure that his arm fits that band. And the play that maybe stands out to me, those plays you guys all mentioned are very significant because they, they were in the attack where the team needs him the most. Um, and sometimes on the wing, you can get lost out there and the game has to come to you. He wasn't going to wait for that game to come to him, but it was that, that time that he made that recovery run all the way in front of his defensive corner flag and busted his butt to go 80 yards and then a sliding tackle. And that is a captain's performance, right, Carter? I just feel like this is a guy that has embraced and appreciated maybe being cast in a light that, that at least in his time in Kansas City, I, I don't think he's, he'd really been thought of before. Well, I, I was just going to say, you know, with Johnny Russell, his ascension since joining the club has been really remarkable because I, I think it's pretty unusual for a player to join a club and have fans immediately just be drawn to that player. And Johnny Russell has not just resonated with his teammates and not just the players that he's maybe more in line with from an age and just, you know, outside of the locker room, off the field you know, interests and just stage of life. He gets along with everybody, whether that's John Luca Busio and some of the young homegrowns or whether that's Matt Beasler and some of the veterans on the team. He's kind of that connecting piece between both sides. That's important in a captain and a leader. On top of that, though, if you're not performing on the field and making, you know, a, a case for why you should be wearing the captain's band with the way that you are performing, not just as an, an attacker with the, the goals that you're scoring, assists and chances you're creating, but Nate, to your point, also playing on the defensive side of the ball, getting back, helping your team in whatever ways the game is calling for you to do in certain situations. So I think Johnny Russell's captain-like qualities kind of span, uh, they, they check every single box in the locker room, off the field, uh, and in the stands with the fans and in the community and, and the way that you know, he's really made it a point to to embrace the way that Kansas City has really embraced him. And, and then just when you when you top it all off with the way he performs on the field, the energy he brings and and just the passion that he has for this club. And, and in such a short amount of time, I, I think it's pretty uh, remarkable. And, and yeah, you can tell that it means a lot to him. Yeah, I mean, we've talked about this before, but you, you see why when Sporting signed him, all the Derby County fans were you know, beside themselves in the mentions. And that's why he is taken, why the fans have taken so quickly to Johnny Russell here as well, because, I mean, he just busts his ass every time he's out there. And um, th those qualities, I, I think, do do lead themselves to to being good while you have a captain on the, on the pitch. And um, I think sporting is actually kind of spoiled for choice in that regard, because mm -hmm. Matt Beasler, Matt Beasler has put in a, a lion's share of captain's performances over the years. Um, he has set the culture along with Graham Zusi and Roger Espinosa. I think either of those guys are worthy captains for different reasons. Zusi, more of a you know silent leader on the field, but um, really leads by example, kind of what we've seen from Johnny Russell. Roger Espinosa, very much a connector, as as Ali just said about Johnny Russell. Roger Espinosa, everyone points to him as he's the guy that gets paired with new guys in the, in in training camp. Uh, he's the guy that is the first one to talk to new guys when they come into the team. Um, he, he's, he spans, you know, the Latinos and, and, and Americans gap. Um, they've just got a really nice culture here. And so I think that even makes it even more impressive that Johnny Russell uh, gets the captain's armband. Well, we see Alan Polito kind of a, the, a star player, captain armband, lead by example, lead by scoring on the pitch. And yeah, I, I think that that makes it even more impressive that Russell gets the armband and that he performs well with the armband as well. And I, and I agree, Nate, that I think, I think he, it's not that he, he hadn't tried hundred percent before, right? but there's just something, I mean, I think he understands what it means at least to fans because he's a fan of the game. And so he wants to do, at least from my perspective, he wants to do right by the fans and, and give them the performance that uh, they expect from a guy wearing an armband. And to bring this conversation full circle, to go back to the match we haven't touched on yet, the Chicago fire game, another guy who's showing that he's worthy of the captain's band. If he ever, if they needed it in a pinch, what about the performance of Winston Reed, particularly in that game, but also really in the stretch of, of starts that he's made here recently. Yeah, yeah, he's been outstanding. And I think, you know, today in the press conference with Peter Vermees and getting, fielding tons of questions about, about Reed and Tim Melia as well, the way that he's come in and, 
you know, use that experience to really help reorganize this Sporting KC defense that had a lot of shining moments throughout the season. And, and obviously rotation has been a huge thing that it's taken away from the consistency that typically a Sporting Kansas City defense possesses. Um, but obviously due to roster congest or schedule congestion and, and roster rotations due to injury and other reasons, you have to make those changes. And this is not a knock on Matt Beasler or Graham Smith or even Roberto Puncic, but um, I, I think Winston Reed has proven in the last three games that he's been a starter and uh, that he's a, a crucial part in keeping this defense organized. The communication that he brings uh, with Tim Mealy, it sounds like a different game when he's on the field and, and helping keep uh, the back line organized, when to step, when to, you know, when to not step on set pieces, where everyone is supposed to be on an assignment basis. And then to see what he was able to do in the attack and, and give sporting a, a real threat in the box on corners and set pieces. You know, he's someone who, because of injuries and just trying to catch himself up to speed wasn't really, uh, I think, you know, for one point in the season, sure, at least in fans eyes, what he, what he had left or, or what he was going to bring. But man, this is, this is someone who is incredibly talented and his experience, I think just speaks for itself when he's on the field. He's yeah, coming into his own. I mean, uh, and you talked about another leader on the pitch. I mean, he held the captain captain's arm a few times for West Ham would have had more, except they got a guy named Mark Noble who's made, you know, 500 appearances. So um, he's he kind of kept Reed from getting a, a few more uh, armbands, but he does it on the pitch. I mean, he scored, you know, we've talked about the the, the goal against Manchester United. Um, another goal that doesn't really get talked about over here as much, but when West Ham dropped down to the championship, the last game they ever played against their arch rivals Millwall at uh, at the at the bowling ground he had a goal and an assist in that game so you know he, he steps up to the moment and um he's really starting to settle in it's been huge for sporting yeah saw a lot of comments from west ham fans after his goal that he scored here about how much they miss him and it kind of like what you said about johnny russell and darby county says something uh when you've won the fans over in england in, in your club there and Winston Reed fits in that category as well. And, they, and they, I think, sorry, I think it says something about sporting scouting department that they continually get guys that that um, the, the fans are disappointed to see leave their club. I was and just going to say that too. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to this whole conversation about guy, you know, being spoiled for choice on the captains. We didn't even mention Elia and Tim Melia, guys like that that a lot of clubs would probably rush to throw the band on. Um, but that's that goes into the scouting department in Kansas city knows exactly what Peter Ramiz is looking for. And that part is every bit as important as the skill component or the athleticism component. And, and that's how you have a culture. Um, well, we'll go, and, ahead and take, and, go ahead. Alex. And Nate, I just wanted to add too. you know, when you look at the homegrowns and the, the Academy pathway, these players are getting to learn how to be a leader and how to be a future captain from some of the very best and to have, so many options about, you know, what, 10 guys that you can make a case for to to wear the captain's band at any given moment for Sporting Kansas City. It's going to make players like John Luca Busio, Jalen Lindsay, uh, and the rest of them a lot better as they progress throughout their careers. All right, we're going to take a quick break because coming up in the next segment, we are going to talk with Sporting Kansas City right back Jalen Lindsay, who could be in line for a whole lot of playing time in the rest of 2020. We'll talk with Jalen right after this on the Sporting Kansas City show. All right, welcome back to the show as uh, we, uh, I'm going to start that over again. Here we go. The Sporting Kansas City Show continues on Sports Radio 810 WHB on uh, wherever you get your podcasts and wherever you stream your video content, the 810 YouTube page and Facebook page and all that good stuff. And uh, if you watch us, you get to see the very handsome face of Jalen Lindsay, who now joins us on the show. Jalen, thanks for joining us, man. How are you? I'm good. How are you guys? We're doing great, and I think that we need to start where uh, Carter Alley and I left off in the last segment, and that is uh, we want to get everybody's perspective that we possibly can on one of the great goals we've ever seen, uh, Eric Hurtado's match winner in this last game. Um, I'll give you my perspective on it in a second, but you were you had a good view. You're on the field oh. for that one. I probably had the best view in the stadium, to be honest with you. Oh my Opposite God. side of the field, right? Like you're look right. Where were you when it happened? And take me through every minute of it, going back to when when T made the pass. Yeah, so I remember we were. I think we were coming up with the ball, and Ilya was dribbling a little bit towards like midfield, and then he played it up to T, or let's just say Dia. We call him T, um, but he played it out to him, 
And then he just kind of like, he plays one to Eric. I see Eric almost like make a run. So like I'm on the right side. So I'm like literally right behind like where Eric was like, where he shot the ball a little bit. So, I mean, the ball's in the air and then I just see Eric jump up and I'm like, no chance he's hitting this right now. Like no way. <laughs> and then all of a sudden he just like hit the ball and it went in and I just see the keeper don't like, didn't move. And I was just like, Oh my gosh. Like I couldn't even run over. Cause I was like, so surprised. I was like, Holy cow. Like what a goal. And so like, I was just I'll do, like, was sitting there for like probably about 10 seconds, like still amazed. And then I would never get water cause I was tired, but uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was amazing. That, like that just like, obviously, obviously I wish that we had everybody in the stadium because I feel like that would be way more electric of how it was, like how the goal was and everything else. But, um, I mean, you got to take what you get during this time, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was an amazing goal. I, I, that was, you know, I was, yeah, I had like the front row seat to it. So it was amazing. So. Jalen, you bring up a really interesting part about just the entire technique that Hurtado used. And he did jump really high in the air. He says uh, that he practices this exact kind of play with uh, T or Dia at practice. Have you ever seen him get that much air, like in a, in a rep of that or anything? No, I mean, Eric's probably one of the most athletic guys we have on the team. And uh, with him, with his, obviously his speed and his build and, you know, the way he can jump, he's... I mean, he's a beast in the air. He's a beast on the, like on the ground as well. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I always, you know, he's always working on finishing and stuff like that. And I know I'm glad it, you know, at some point it paid off and it paid off in a great way to get us the win. So I'm um, super proud that, you know, obviously it just shows that, you know, practice, you know, it helps, you know, with coming into the game and, um, you know, I'm just very happy for him. He looked like the karate kid a little bit. I don't yeah, know for you real, seriously. <laughs> You really did, Jalen. What was the what was the reaction after the, in the locker room? Uh, just uh, mostly about the goal, but you know the fact that it led to three points as well. I'm wondering, uh, was it a big buzz going on in the locker room? Oh, I mean, yeah, everybody was, you know, obviously happy. You got obviously I got the music blaring and stuff like that. Um, I mean, everyone was just, you know, shake each other's hands, like smiling, uh, which is always good because you always want to come out with three points, especially at home and stuff like that. So it's always a good mood, and then. It was, all, it was pretty funny that, you know, when Hurtado came in from his interview, I think everyone just started screaming. We all started jumping up and down and stuff like that. So, yeah, it was a good vibe in the locker room afterwards. And, I mean, that's just like what you want after a game is to get three points and have that good vibe in the locker room. We've got Jalen Lindsay with us. It's funny that you say that about how you, you were almost too blown away by the goal to rush up and celebrate with him. We've seen a great picture of Johnny Russell right behind him with his hands <laughs> on his face. And I, as the guy trying to call the, the play – we have a pretty good view from up there. And I saw that, that T was playing him the ball and, and there was a split second where I could see it looked like he was winding up to shoot it. Like he wasn't, he wasn't setting himself up to bring it down. Yeah. And I, I, I swear I was thinking in my head, he's really going to, he's really going to try to hit this <laughs> thing. And I was thinking with kind of little skepticism, you know, like, I mean, come yeah. on, you know, and <laughs> he goes in and I had that moment like you did of just jaw on the floor and then it like hits me, I'm supposed to say something right now. <laughs> and, and I'm supposed to say something that's worthy of a moment like this. And I don't know what to say, you yeah. know, like what's, what are the words that are going to come out of my mouth? Cause this is going to get replayed a whole bunch. <laughs> I hope I don't say something really stupid exactly. right now. <laughs> Cause it was, it was one of those moments, not very many times on a field where you watch it and you just want to stand there and stare. Right. Like, <laughs> No, trust me. I, I mean, I was the same way. I mean, if I were in your position, I probably wouldn't have said anything for at least 10 seconds. I would probably been like, uh, what? <laughs> uh, but yeah, what a goal though. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited. I got to see it like obviously front row. So it was pretty good. Jalen, your spirits are high. You talk about the post game in the locker room and the spirits of the team being really high three straight wins, but it hasn't always been that easy this season. Where is this team at mentally right now going into a really important stretch of games over a short amount of time with playoff implications on the line? Uh, yeah, I think the team's mentality right now, obviously the last you know three games, getting the three wins gives us a huge confidence boost to go into this next couple, at least with, you know, obvious, obviously, and, you know, there's a game every so other days or whatever. So uh, we just got to bring that confidence with us each and every game. And we got to go into tomorrow, uh, you know, wanting to win and hopefully, you know, we get three points and get out of there and move on to the next one. So uh, we're just trying to take, you know, each game at a time because you can't worry about the ones, you know, in the future just yet. You got to worry, worry about the one that's closest to us. Um, so I think just going into that, having the confidence, you know, 
that we need to build off of from the last couple of games and uh, just need to play the same way that we do and um, just bring that same confidence in the next couple of games. How about you yourself, man? Uh, we got news from Peter Vermeeser in the, the press conference today that it sounds like Graham Zussi won't be back for a while. We don't know the exact details yet, but uh, that's to come. Uh, you, you yourself in, into the starting lineup now. How, how are you feeling about what, your place in the team and and, and uh, perhaps how that back line is gelling together? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's never you know good news to hear something like that, um, and it's obviously pretty hard to you know fill shoes of Graham Zusi, obviously a club legend and obviously a great player with the national team, whatever. So, um, you know, it's it's a good thing that I've been learning from in the past couple of years. Um, you know, to see, you know, what he kind of does to succeed on the pitch and off the field as well. Um, so, you know, it's it, obviously, like I said, it's, it's hard, it's hard shoes to fill, but, you know, I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try to go out there and, you know, play my game. And um, obviously, you know, got to get in the, you know, the same chemistry as, you know, with the other guys in the back line, you know, just got to communicate uh, with them and uh, just try to gel with them a little bit during practice. And, you know, that's the, that's the time to, you know, get that chemistry in practice and just work with each other and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm working to get there. You know, I'm, I'm been working my hardest, you know, in, in training and, you know, obviously in the game. So um, all I need to do is just, you know, have the confidence that, you know, obviously I know I can play in this league and uh, with this team as well. So I'm excited to see, um, you know, how the team does the next couple of games and especially myself. Um, you know, I'm sure I can, um, you know, try to fill the shoes as best I can, but uh, I'm going to go out there and do my best. Hey, look, Jalen, it's, it's not just about filling the shoes, man. It's about showing out, right? Like you, you are a player that is highly rated as a young guy. Um, sporting has, has brought you up in their system for a reason. They've always liked you. And of course, none of us would ever wish anything on a player like Graham. It's, it's, it's terrible to hear that he might have a long-term injury. You've had a long-term injury yourself, by the way, that I, I would point out, but I was talking to Benny Failhaber about this. Ali and I were actually having a conversation with him a while back about young players and where they should go, you know, when, when it comes to destinations overseas or whatever. And Benny said, hey, number one thing that a young player needs more than the location, more than the system or anything is they need minutes. They need to play. Yeah. And you're getting minutes now. And however that comes, you didn't choose that. How important is that for you, especially when you look at like what, what Boos has done and his growth with the minutes he's gotten this year? How excited are you and, and how significant do you think that is? Why does it matter so much for you to get a significant run of minutes uh, like, like it looks like you're about to get? Um, yeah, it's, it's super important. I mean, for me, um, I think playing games and, and trying to play as many minutes as you can is like the best way to learn and you know, develop as a player. Um, just getting those game reps in because those are like real life, you know, real life game situations that um, they maybe sometimes you don't do well and sometimes you do well. I mean, you're just, you're always learning, you know, at some point and, you know, when you're playing a game. So um, yeah, it's, it's so important to get minutes. Cause I mean, you, you see all these young guys and, you know, the rest of the league, I mean, especially like Lucio, uh, you know, every, almost every game he plays, it's almost like he's getting better and better. So um, it's just, just getting those minutes, it just gets you, you know, adapted to the league a little bit, adapted to the, to the speed of play. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm excited to get these minutes, you know, you know, coming soon, these next couple of games, and uh, just trying to get a little, you know, a good run for me going a little bit. And, you know, hopefully I can, you know, a little bit, you know, break out in the next couple of games and, you know, show what I can showcase, you know, with my games as well. So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited to get these minutes, and it's something I've been waiting for. So I'm excited to go after it. Jalen, speaking of – those reps and the importance of getting those minutes. Let's go back a couple of, of weeks, months, however long it's been. A tough 5-2 loss against Houston. You're up against one of the best in Albert Elise. And it was, it was a really tough game for Sporting Kansas City, and especially on the defensive side of the ball, conceding five goals. And Vermees commented after the game how proud he was of the way that you – you worked through it and you and the rest of the defense and the rest of the team kind of moved past that game. Let's go. Can you take me back to, to what you were feeling after that game and, and your efforts and, and goals to, to continue to get better with this team in the games and the weeks following it? Uh, yeah. I mean, after that game, uh, I was pretty, you know, devastated. Um, I mean, for me, I look back on it. I, I know it was one of my best games and, you know, that's, that's the midst of it. It's games. Sometimes you have, you know, good days. Sometimes you have bad days, you know? So um, that's just something, you know, I've learned and, you know, I look back on, on it and that's what I'm saying. Just getting those minutes is some days you have good, good, good games, you know, sometimes you have bad games and it's just all about learning. And, you know, 
from that game, I've learned so much. And I feel like these, you know, couple games, even the couple games after that and, you know, the games recently, um, I just improved so much as a player. And that, that's why I go back to you know, getting the game minutes because you get the real life game situations. And instead of like just training all the time um, is difficult because you're not, you know, getting those actual situations and, you know, in the game. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, it was one of my best games and, you know, I, I just, I had to learn back or I had to learn from it. And, you know, I, I feel bad because I know I feel like I let the team down. I feel like I let, you know, maybe some of the fans down, but, um, you know, I, I'm always just down to improve and, you know, I'm, I'm going to improve for the fans and, you know, I'm going to show them that, you know, that's, that's not really me all the time. And I'm going to show them that, you know, I'm the type of player that will go out there and work 110%, you know, for the club and, you know, and for the city as well and for the fans. So, um, yeah, I'm going to go out there and, you know, do my best and I'm going to, you know, show that, you know, I have the ability to play in this league and ability to play with the team. So I'm excited. I think uh, I think we've seen that. I think Peter Vermees has actually highlighted your performance in the in the game after that Houston game as well. So we've, we've seen the bounce back ability already. Um, you talked about the games coming thick and fast and, and they start uh, with, with Dallas tomorrow. I'm curious. The last game at home against Dallas, uh, there were some afters after the after the whistle. Um, I, I think several players and coaching staff took uh, exception to kind of their tactics at the end of the game, and it looked to get a little chippy there towards the end. Um, uh, is that in the in the back of your mind heading into into this one against FC Dallas that, that perhaps it could get a little a uh, little testy out there on the field? Uh, no, I'm sure it can, but you know I'll tell you what. Uh especially preparing for this game coming up. I mean, we're going to go down there with a fight. I mean, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to go down there and just, you know, let them, you know, with their tactics, you know, bosses around a little bit. Like we're going to go down there, you know, we're going to try to get those three points and, you know, show them that like they can't just come and do that, what they did, you know, in our stadium and stuff like that. So, you know, we're going to go down there and try to get three points and, you know, show them what's up because, um, you know, obviously last time they, you know, came to us and they, you know, they beat us obviously and obviously got a little chippy after. So, you know, we're going to try to go down there and get three points ourselves and, you know, show them that, um, you know, that we're actually here. We're like, you know, obviously we're, we're in third place right now, but uh, I'm sure like they're showing behind right now, but we, we got to show them what we're about. And, you know, we're not going to, we're going to go down there and try to get three points. So um, yeah, we're going to go down there with a fight, you know, we're trying to get out there with three points. So we're excited. All right, Allie, I, I know Jalen's got a place to be. I'm going to wrap it up unless you have a final question. Sometimes you have one. <laughs> this does happen, but no, I don't. Okay, I just make it sure. I had some What's FIFA questions, but, but we'll save them. I had FIFA questions, but we'll save them for later. No, Carter, go ahead. Fire a FIFA question at him real quick, and then I'll and then I'll wrap it up. Hey, the game just came out, so I'm just curious. You know, what do you think about your rating? Obviously, number one, that's the big thing. And then uh, two, what do you, uh, what uh, what do you think about the game so far? Um, yeah, I think my rating. I think it actually improved. Actually, uh, I mean, obviously, when I, I think the I, think, I don't know if the, how, how they base the game off of, but I think obviously, and like I guess. Was it like usually they do like a year before maybe is that right? I so, so like I obviously so. I was injured in uh, you know 2019. So I was sitting there I'm like I'm like oh my rating is pretty higher. <laughs> I was like okay I'll take it. That's fine with me. So uh, yeah I know I, I know I noticed a couple of stats kind of improved a little bit. So you know I'm I'm grateful for that. You know obviously the, the you know the more the better. So um, yeah I mean I've now I played it a little bit and it's not it's not too bad. I liked it better than 20. So. Um, I need to play a lot more to, you know, see how it feels. So, well, wait till they see all these minutes you get this year. You get to show them what you really, really, really do. And next year, yeah. that rating is going to go through the roof. Hey, Jalen, my last question will wrap sure. it up. When you were talking about, hey, we're going to take the fight down to him in Dallas, I'm curious about the balance there because it seems to me like a lot of the antics that we see from teams like FC Dallas are designed as much to get you in your head and get you off your game, get you distracted because you're, you're mad at them for taking so long to take their throw-ins and all the other faking injuries and things like that, that all of a sudden you lose sight of what we're really here for, you know? And so how do you balance that, hey, we're going to take it to them, but at the same time, we can't lose focus on the main goal in this game? Uh, yeah, I know Peter's always telling us before games to, um, I mean, especially he told us that in Chicago at halftime, he's just said, you know, don't let the game get to your head. Just focus on what we need to do and focus on, you know, the way we need to play. And, you know, I think we're just going to transfer that, what that, that advice that you said at halftime to this game as well. Cause obviously, like you said, it was chippy last time. So, and I'm sure they're going to, you know, try to get in our head, you know, try to do all they can, you know, to get three points. But that's what I'm saying. We're going to go down there and, you know, try to do all we can to get three points. But 
at the same time, uh, we all know that we need to be focused on the job we, we need to do. You know, we just need to play our game, get some goals, try to get a clean sheet, and, you know, just try to get out there with three points. So, um, yeah, just, just, just trying to find that balance. And, you know, I'm sure all the guys know that we just need to keep our head, you know, going to this game. Hey, Jalen, thanks so much for the time, man. Get going. We appreciate you and have a great trip now to, uh, to Dallas. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate you guys. All right, that is Jalen Lindsay. We'll take a break. Back to wrap things up. We got a lot of news to cover for you in our last segment of the Sporting Kansas City show right after this. A couple of housekeeping things, guys, before we sign off today. Number one, haven't gotten to the news yet about the further change in the schedule. Allie, it came out this week that even though there are no, no new positive tests on the Colorado Rapids side, their next three games are being postponed. That includes the October 21st game of Sporting Kansas City versus the Colorado Rapids. Um, and it's going to be – I'm trying to figure out how are they going to fit these games in for the Rapids and what happens for the rest of the season there. But uh, three games postponed over the weekend as well. So this is starting to become a, a, quite a challenge for Major League Soccer. Yeah, well, fingers crossed that this is really the only team that they're going to have to deal with when it comes to uh, having a lot of schedule movement and, and trying to figure out how to make up games because if – it was more than just uh, Colorado Major League Soccer would be in a lot of trouble, but Sporting Kansas City kind of catching a break uh, with the postponement of that game on the 21st. Obviously, such great news that there have been no new positive tests for Colorado. That's, you know, massive and hopefully everyone is recovering and staying safe and healthy. But, you know, Sporting catches a huge break there, I think, just with, you know, the the roster or the schedule congestion congestion that we've been talking about and, and, you know, being without Alan Polito and, and all of the other players that they have injured. So I think this will be a uh, potentially good thing for sporting Kansas city, but interested to see what MLS does when it comes to making up these games. Well, some of the reports we saw Carter suggest that they might have to go with a points per game model for the playoffs. Now, I think a real difficulty comes in if all of a sudden Colorado's played, let's say five to six fewer games than everyone else to go up points per game, but it could affect sporting Kansas city. Cause remember they've already had one game postponed against Colorado. Now they've got another one coming up. So we keep talking about how important it is to rack up points for SKC, but maybe Carter, we should also be really paying close attention to points per game for sporting because they might not end up playing as many games as everybody else. You have to say that's at least a possibility now. Yeah. I think we've talked about that throughout this, these past couple of months though, because not not of our thinking of it, but literally like Tim Mealy has been talking about it ever since they got back from Orlando. So I think teams, I think guys on teams are smart enough to um, play ahead in their mind, you know, what happens if a team has uh, an outbreak. And a lot of them already thought this might happen. It was always a possibility and it has happened. So um, I think, I think the players have been kind of playing with points per game in mind the, the past month or two. Uh, but it is, a di I mean, like you said, if it's five or six game difference, that's huge. So I'm really curious what they're going to do. I, I wondered if maybe they would just drop a game off everyone's schedule instead of play 23, play 22, you know, and, and that might allow a little bit of time to squeeze in a, a, a couple Colorado games. Um, at this point, it feels like so many teams are getting in the playoffs anyways as well that, you know, obviously the right on the playoff line there, that extra game will be a big difference. But in the grand scheme of things, there, it, it won't have a huge effect on the season. So I, I'm really curious. It's a tough situation to be in with this Colorado situation. So um, I, I, MLS has their hands full, and I, I wonder what they're going to opt to do. Right, listening to Paul Tenorio and, and reading some of his and, and Sam Stagecoll's work, they do point out there's that international window in November, right after the end of the regular season. Maybe they give you a little bit of wiggle room to put a game or two in there, but start making up five, six games. That's a different story. Allie, I saved one other story uh, specifically for you, but for all of us, really. And that is a report coming out as we saw Ben Olsen was let go from D.C. United, and they're looking for a new coach. Former U.S. Women's National Team uh, head coach Jill Ellis, Carter Augustine's had a chance to interview her a couple of times, uh, as have I, uh, among the candidates to fill the open coaching vacancy at D.C. United. Ali, I want you to give the first reaction to this new story. I would love to see it, Nate. I thought you made a great point on Twitter that, you know, we see men coach women's teams all the time, and it's the majority. It's not even the minority in, in those cases. So 
I think, you know, there's been this stigma around women coaching men's sports for a very long time. And whether that's because of the locker room culture or whatever people want to point to, a good coach is a good coach and a qualified coach is a qualified coach and soccer is soccer. I think that Jill Ellis has proven herself incredibly worthy of that type of role. It's going, you know, there's going to be a process in place. They're going to do their interviews and, and go through the, the necessary process in order to make that decision. But it would be really cool to see MLS, Nate, like you mentioned, on the on the leading edge here to, you know, name the first uh, pro uh, head coach in MLS, you know, as, as a woman of one of their men's teams. So I, I think it's great. And I think it's just even great to see her name in the mix and hope to see more of this. You know, you're starting to see women coaches, referees, trainers in sports all across the country and, and all over the world, football, NBA, whatever it is uh, get recognition for the work that they do. And I, and I think people are starting to realize, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a male or a female thing. It's, it's a coach and this is your profession. And if you're good at what you do, at, if you're good at what you do, you're going to get uh, the best jobs. And so I hope Jill Ellis is, is strongly considered and, and good for her for, for getting this interview and excited to see what, what comes of it. Yeah. Like you said, I mean, her resume, that's pretty, pretty tough to beat. And, I know she has her detractors. It's interesting to me that there's some former players of hers on the U.S. women's team that that are detractors of hers, um, and people saying, "Hey, you have all." She had all the talent in the world. Of course, she has to win. But for me, I'm like, U.S. doesn't win every single World Cup, you know. And how come no one before her could win back to back? So, um, I, I think I would love. I think she's a great coach. I would love to see. Uh, I'd love to see her get a shot. Yeah, they're, they're, what she did in this last World Cup to me with the pressure that team was under, um, the, the increasing talent level around the rest of the world. And there is something to be said about playing with a massive target on your back as that mm -hmm. team did, and they won. And I, I'll just use my own frame of reference on this. I watched Andrea Hooty as a strength and conditioning coordinator at, coordinator at the University of Kansas, got to know her personally, uh, developed some of the strongest, toughest men's basketball players that I've ever seen. You talk about guys like the Morris twins who are known as like enforcers at the NBA level. They credit her with their career because she, and they, and they said they didn't think when, when they had a, a female trying to tell them what to do in the weight room at first, they, 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 they didn't want to take her seriously. She earned their respect right away and became men because of that like grew from boys to men because of her. I saw that happen firsthand. There's no reason it, it, uh, it can't happen uh, when it comes to head coaching in soccer and basketball, sports like this. Um, it's, uh, I, to me, it's a matter of time. So we'll see. I don't know if Jill will also get the job, but uh, we wish her the best of luck. Last thing, guys, some quick thoughts on the game tomorrow night against FC Dallas. Carter, I'll start with you. These games are coming fast and furious now. Squad rotation could come into play as well. But it's another now we get back into playing a team that's sporting no pretty well. Emphasis on furious in this one, Nate, because uh, that last game was a feisty one. And uh, you've said it a few times, this familiarity is really starting to breed contempt. And I think especially between these two teams. So that's for me, what I'm looking at is the clash on the field and who handles it well. I don't know about you, Allie. Yeah, no, I, I think that this is going to be a – a game that sporting is going to, if they haven't been getting up for games already, they're going to be getting up for this one because this is one that they definitely want back after what we saw go down uh, just about a month ago. And, you know, a couple of things to watch for. Elie Sanchez and Michael Barrios both playing on a yellow card if they get one more in this game facing suspension. And, and you know, this is a game where Michael Barrios could very well have his way with sporting Kansas City. He's posed a threat, you know, in, in all the games they've played him in so far this season. And, I don't know. It's, it's just a, it's, it's a tough matchup for sporting Kansas city. This is an FC Dallas team that spreads their scoring around They're They're going to come out and play tough and maybe even play a little dirty as we've seen before. So uh, it's going to be a good one, but I think sporting Kansas city in their recent form and, and riding the momentum of, of three straight wins is going to come in looking a bit different than they might've even looked uh, about a month ago. The time wasting tactics by FC Dallas were uh, beyond embarrassing last time around. That's one of the things that led to a lot of the bad blood that Carter's talking about. Um, but I, here, here's what I'm looking for. Should Sporting Kansas City have a lead on the road late in this game? 
Will they try to give FC Dallas a little taste of their own medicine? Will they stick to their principles and say the game's not to be supposed to be played that way? Um, and how will FC Dallas react if and when Sporting KC have about three different guys lined up to take a free kick before they actually kick it? Uh, I hope we get to see that scenario just to see the way it plays out in the game. Should be fun. 7.30 on Wednesday night. You can hear it right here on Sports Radio 810 WHB and watch it on Fox Sports Kansas City. All right, that's going to do it for us, guys. For Carter Augustine and Allie Trost, this is Nate Bucati saying thanks for listening and watching, and we'll see you next time on the Sporting Kansas City Show.